everybody thd podcast again coming to you uh i'm in hong kong again as always uh, not going anywhere this year and uh with us as always the co-host from japan simon weston hey simon how you doing very good thank you all right and uh special guest today thank you very much for joining us eric wiederholz coming from uh, uh chicago representing Knowles um over there so how's it going in chicago today eric uh pretty good pretty good all yeah. right doing well Good, good. So um, we asked you on today, we wanted to talk about uh, MEMS microphones, um, a special little piece of kit, uh, anybody's tearing apart a uh, mobile phone or Bluetooth headphones, they see this little silver box on the board. Some people might think it's an oscillator or a crystal, but it's actually a little digital microphone. Um, so um, <clears throat> maybe Simon, you want to lead the charge on to the the discussion uh, and what you wanted to find out from Eric about the MEMS today. So um, <clears throat> in the ancient history, we all used electric microphones, especially we're going to talk mostly about ANC stuff. We're using electric microphones for ANC and uh, there's a bit of a hangover from that, but increasingly people are wanting to use MEMS microphones. And uh, I wonder if you're able to sort of contrast those two a little bit to give us some idea of uh, what would be the advantages or disadvantages of a MEMS versus an electric to, to kick it off. Yeah, right. And that's a common question. Um, Quite often, when we looked at uh, electrets in the past, uh, one of the great things about them, they're very affordable, um, cost effective. Uh, you can get really great um, SNR. Um, so 72, 73, even some 74 uh, dB type of, of SNRs, um, which you know are great for a system. Um, some of the negatives that definitely fall into that are power supply rejection ratio. Um, obviously, as battery voltage fluctuates, so will the signal output. Um, collapsing is definitely a problem. Uh, so the membrane actually is a tensioned diaphragm. Um, those are typically held together by hydroscopic glues. Um, so temperature, heat, humidity, that tension changes. Actually, your SNR is changing dramatically during that period of time. Um, and then also, so noise is changing all the time as well too. Um, so, you know, those are those are things we dealt with for a lot of years, but as time has evolved and we're now working in the digital domain mostly anyway, um, reliability is becoming more and more of a situation we're all trying to work with, right? And, and David, you had just mentioned a little bit about uh, membranes and waterproofing and mm -hmm. and all of those actually have effects to our microphones um, and so stability is really one of the greatest things about MEMS microphones so heat humidity temperature um, those things just they don't change uh, literally a half a dB is quite normal um, and so those are things that are really great it, it is is a piece of silicon um, it's not tensioned uh, it, there are some de designs that are tension, but that tension is, is very uh, 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 constricted. So it's not changing due to heat and humidity and, and other factors like that. Right. Um, so then we get back to SNR ratios. So SNR ratios have improved dramatically. You know, MEMS used to be, you know, 58, 59 dB six, seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. Those are now, we have a 69 dB SNR microphone. We have 70 dB SNR microphones. In the hearing health division, which is sometimes used in true wireless designs, or we're, we're nearing uh, 71 dB SNR. And we have a, a pathway in the near future, not too far off to 73 to 74 dB SNR. So, so the, uh, the signal to noise ratio of an electric microphone, uh, is that kind of proportional related to the diaphragm surface area? Um, it is it is not necessarily to to surface area uh, because you we think about that with loudspeakers and moving air and yeah. the reverse of being actuated by a certain amount of surface area. Um, so a lot of those things can be mitigated in this kind of effect because a lot of that is backplate charge. So in Electra, you know that's the case. Uh, in um, uh, men's microphones, it's a charge pump. Um, so you can play games with gains and, and some of those kind of things uh, that happen uh, in a design. 
um, to make those uh, those effects not really. It's not a surface area play. Um, and do you, you think know, that um, just to, just to cut in, in in the case of an electric microphone, just because it's a bit more common, uh, you tend to say you you end up with a certain level of noise floor generated from perhaps from your jade fit as much as anything. And so the SNR is about pushing the sensitivity up more so than pushing that noise floor down. I mean, they're just, they're moving in sympathy. Is it a similar uh, case for the uh, MEMS? Um, yeah, it can be. I mean, there's a lot of games you can play. So there's what becomes really important is some of the thermal viscous um, type of noise issues that happen because you have really small gaps. Um, there's now uh, really small holes for the inlet. Uh, there's barometric reliefs. Um, so those can affect low frequency SNR. Um, there's ASIC noise. Uh, we're doing a digital analog to digital conversion internally. Um, and then uh, there's charge pump voltage and digital gains and analog gains. So there's a lot of games that we play to maximize all of those. Um, as you look at the typical electret, they're pretty large in comparison. Um, you know, and they can't be, you can't be reflowed as an example. Um, but, uh, you know, when we look at microphone. Oh. Noise, we typically look at acoustic noise, um, but those are kind of the two biggest. Um, and so when you look at a MEMS microphone, you look at uh, what is acoustic noise in a microphone? It's the random molecules just uh, bouncing around and accidentally hitting the diaphragm. They're not the intended signal. Um, and so uh, when you're in a really small device, that acoustic noise tends to go up. And if you've seen some of the size of electrets, um, I have an example here, which you will not see, and that's probably kind of the point. <laughs> um, these are, you know, this is our smallest device and I'm pretty sure you can't see that, but you can see the size of my finger to the smallest device. Yes. I mean, these are really, really small devices, uh, as mentioned before. Uh, so acoustic noise can be is a, a major part of that equation. Um, then the ASIC noise, electrical noise, and then the MEMS motor itself has some noise. Barometric relief, as I said, is a, a, a additional noise factor at, at lower frequencies there. So the barometric relief, um, it, that's a pathway between the front and rear side of the diaphragm, which would otherwise be uh, perfectly isolated. Yeah, correct. And so, you know, we, we all travel, you think you, you go in a plane and, and we need to stabilize that, that air pressure on either side. So, you know, you go up to 30,000 feet, there's lots less pressure. If we didn't have what's called a barometric relief. Um, that diaphragm would want to displace because it has a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other side. Uh, similar to in an earphone, you know, with a, a dynamic driver, that would exactly happen in, in the same situation there. So that barometric relief is actually a high pass filter. So as a microphone, uh, you may want it to play flat to DC. Um, however, we don't have a, a barometric relief. That, and I do actually have some uh, graphs of that in, in my presentation. Uh, but that roll off then has less sensitivity. We're rolling off frequency. That means the signal to noise ratio goes down in that band. Um, and that's uh, one of the implications too. Um, that feeds into A and C, because a lot of times we're trying to cancel noise at lower frequencies. And that roll off can affect one phase for the stability of our ANC and two, the noise that we're creating uh, inherently at the low frequencies as well. It always seemed to me that um, uh, uh, MEMS microphones were sort of, uh, a lot of them were rolling off from about 100 hertz. It almost looked as though that was like a standard. Is there a reason for setting it at that level or, or is this just something that happened by chance? Yeah, really, it really happened by, okay, uh, you know, MEMS really evolved around the cell phone market, uh, and that was kind of 100 hertz was good enough um, back in the day, and, and that's really trans uh, transcended since then. Even cell phone manufacturers are now requesting much uh, lower frequencies for yeah. beam forming performance, uh, voice performance. Um, you know, there's a lot of audio zoom and 
uh, techniques like that about, um, you know, if I'm taking a picture or I'm taking video, I want the microphone SNR to be bested, you know, three meters from my phone. So multiple microphones on the phone to do that, lower frequencies. Um, w one of the reasons initially, I think, why that LFRO was so much higher too um, was wind noise. Uh, a lot of low frequency energy, you're outside. How do I mitigate that? Let's just not even produce the low frequencies. There's still some a lot of high frequency energy there, a, a ton actually. Um, so that didn't um, remove 100% of the problem, but did remove part of the problem. And I think that was part of the, the design aspects of why it wasn't important then, but it is now. Very interesting. Very good. Now, did you want to run through, you mentioned presentation. How about we run through some slides and uh, give us some talking points? Yeah, and I think uh, I, I'm free to have, you know, we can divert the conversation uh, wherever we want to. Um, but this is just kind of what I prepared right now. Yeah, you got to watch out for Simon. He'll, t he'll take you down a, a tech hole. <laughs> <laughs> No, there is a couple of other little uh, things that I was curious about in terms of uh, what's the possibility of uh, destroying the, uh, in a MEMS microphone, do you call it a diaphragm? Should I be calling it a diaphragm? Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, can you destroy the diaphragm? So in, in, a, in a electric, you can just collapse it against the plate and you, it doesn't really do any permanent damage, but yeah, in a MEMS. Um, and, and absolutely you can. Um, and so... There are design aspects out there that are, some are really durable, some are not. Um, we do drop tests and, you know, uh, we're worried about how many kilogies can a diaphragm uh, sustain. Um, the designs are much more robust than they ever used to be. I mean, with SNRs came robustness um, and particle ingress and all these kind of things that we have to worry about, um, not just performance. Um, reliability is kind of that hidden spec that you really don't see in a data sheet. Um, and yeah. you know, just as we've evolved our own microphone development, we have improved over the ages of, you know, what our designs can do uh, and our models can do. Um, so breaking is typically not an issue. Um, we really have a, a really great design uh, from that aspect. Um, we generally do even up to a normal 100% test um, is about 100 PSI. So one of the situations that may happen is vacuum pick and, pick and place. Uh, um, right. And if you're on a top port, for, for an example, the microphone port is exposed to potential vacuum, which could actually do a really quick, uh, faster than you could equalize with a barometric relief. Uh, time constant, um, you know, when you pick in place, you could suck a vacuum through the diaphragm and crack it and break it. Um, yeah. Those used to be, I mean, some very old designs we used to, that's how we found some of those problems, right, was from those applications. Um, but now, like, uh, and a standard test is 100 PSI uh, uh, pressure into the microphone port. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's, that's interesting because I remember in my early experiences dealing with the MEMS on the waterproofing front, in a vacuum plasma coating situation is we were popping some of the mics and getting fallout on a project. And then what we do, we reduced the, uh, the grade that we pulled the vacuum. So we slowed the pull in pressure right. and that helped compensate a bit. Um, yep, so that, was, that can be more of a ratio. And, and so that's a great uh, um, point to go to because as we go towards lower LFRO, um, for ANC designs, that inherently means that Pierce is smaller. And therefore, the time constant to equalize pressure right. for something as pick and place or something like that, that ramp rate changes. Um, even when we, uh, when we manufacture the MEMS, we have a really hot air volume, we're soldering a can over top of that. And so there's a lot of pressure from the heat built up in there and we need to equalize too. The really L low LFRO microphones, we have some five Hertz LFRO microphones for very special conditions. And we had to revamp our process because 
during that reflow of the top can uh, soldering to the PCB to actually cover the, the MEMS motor and ASIC and all that, um, that we were popping the tops of the can. The pressure was so great, was actually not equalizing fast enough because of a very, very small pierce. Um, so yeah, no, there's, we're introducing some better performance uh, with lower LFROs. We also induce manufacturing difficulties that we have to overcome. So sometimes simple problems become uh, very huge when you make 17 million microphones a day. Right. And that goes right down to testing. Um, how do you test? What's the settling time? How do you, uh, you know, measure sensitivity? How do you measure low frequencies? Low frequencies require more settling time. Um, these are, you know, we take those for granted when we measure 10 in a lab. <laughs> right. So, very interesting. Yep. Um, Can I ask a little bit, uh, the slides are there, but I, it sort of follows on from the low frequency roll off point. Um, yep. The uh, basis of a microphone design is that it actually operates, its operating range is below fundamental resonance. So uh, ideally you have a perfectly flat response up until we hit that resonance. Right. Yep. And so for a typical electric microphone, the, it, like a four millimeter, for example, it's in the range of four or five kilohertz. But mm -hmm. the MEMS is way up at uh, uh, over 10 kilohertz, something like that. Is that right? Well, it's way higher than that. So, we, and we're raising that even higher uh, in most of our systems. Um, and there's good reason for that. So voice has really brought that on. And I do cover a little bit about that in here. Uh, I did a, a piece by simulation kind of showing what happens when, when we start adding the mechanical world onto our microphone. So, you know, you look at a data sheet and it's a microphone in the, in the free field. Um, so that's, that's the perfect world. So if we look at what happens below a mechanical resonance, we're in the compliance controlled region, right? And so that's where compliance can affect um, our microphone um, uh, sensitivity and, and some of those kind of things. And, and also where the resonance inertance and the mass of uh, the air load, the tubing length, all of those have impacts into our microphone response. So if you took a, a typical electret and those resonances are, you know, seven, eight kilohertz, maybe in a larger one, you, you know, depending on their size, maybe you get one at 10 kilohertz or so, but that's generally where they reside. And then you start adding acoustic tubing, noise, et cetera. They generally have a low Q resonance, so it's not too severe. But once you start adding on those mechanical um, uh, effects, uh, the resonance moves down much lower. Um, and so that can prevent that microphone from actually have flat phase response and um, a flat frequency response. Um, and so maybe that's not a big deal. Uh, maybe it's not a high quality system. Um, not that you can't have a high quality system with Electret, but you know, that bandwidth is, is limited, uh, definitely. Um, when we look at a MEMS microphone, most of them are at least 22, 23 kilohertz, and most of our newer products are um, the 35 to 42 kilohertz range. And a lot of that is driven by voice. So when we start adding, oh, there's an eight microphone array on the top of an IoT device or in an earphone, they're not exactly in the perfect position. So we add millimeters of length and diameter and we try to prevent dust ingress so we want those pipes to be small um, we're adding more mass to that diaphragm the resonances move down easily to um, 15 kilohertz if you're not careful you can get them down to 8 and 10 kilohertz and now you have and the mems design particularly has a very high q um, we can put some uh, acoustic uh, meshes in there to help reduce that, um, you know, your traditional Saudi DOP or BOP, whatever type of meshes you want to put in there. Um, however, now you have a 10, 12 dB gain at eight kilohertz. Um, and when you start taking processing algorithms, they design those algorithms about having a flat response. So you got an algo guy in a room who knows nothing about acoustics from the mechanical load aspect 
and he just got you know 12 db more gain in, in his algorithm and everything just did, got destroyed nothing's working properly what's going on uh, and that's what we want to try and prevent um the second kind of situation is also that ultrasonics are becoming extremely popular mm. a lot of people are using these as motion detection um uh even noise detection in failure analysis uh bearings failing um so these, there's a lot of different situations where uh that high frequency performance is actually a benefit in a lot of applications uh, um, that must be a, a, a much much nicer market than consumer electronics the the industrial uh, test and measures section yeah, and there's the one thing where it's absolutely not a good thing is when we when we look at our hearing health division, they they like a little more of the Electra uh, type of design, and so we have MEMS that don't have very good ultrasonic performance, and that's from the hearing aid perspective. If I have hearing aids in my ear and I walk in, there's a PIR sensor for a security system that's ultrasonic, and that actually modulates into the hearing aid. And now they're hearing pinging or ringing uh, backup sensors on cars. Um, there's other sensors inside the car that technology is now adding. So ultrasonics in that case can be a negative impact. Um, so it is a delicate balance of, uh, you know, what's the application, what's the design, and how, do we, how are we going to utilize it? Wow, interesting. Yeah. Um, I do have to say I never learned more about acoustics than I started – learning about microacoustics. <laughs> yeah, just thinking about the scope of the market that you service, whether it's automotive or industrial or hearing health or consumer. I mean, uh, it, yeah. I mean, and I mean it, sound is everywhere. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's just something people uh, don't think about. As far as those more exotic cases, I mean, it's not uncommon for two to three times a year where I run into an application for medical um, or, you know, uh, doing a heart sensor or so that's low frequency involved or doing, uh, some university doing study on bats. So you got the ultrasonic case, um, up, up to hundred kilohertz in a lot of these situations. So those are very rare and we're, we're not really designing towards those, but we do have bandwidth up there. So it, it can be pretty interesting. There's a lot of different applications you run into. Very good. All right, so we keep going through a bit of presentation here. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so these were kind of some of the things that I've laid out as critical, and, and I think we've, we've kind of talked about some of these already, and AOP was one of those, which is uh, acoustic overload point. Uh, as an industry standard, that's generally a line in the sand of 10% THD. Um, 1% THD, that's kind of understood uh it's kind of a metric of you know how loud can we get and still be at lower thd um, we're driving our designs towards that um some of our older models kind of had maybe one percent thd maybe at 112 db but 10 percent would be at 125 so you had this kind of slow climb in thd up until you reach that 10 percent limit but when we start talking about A and C, um, we, you know, you're trying to cancel distortion. So I don't want more distortion in my signal. Um, so a lot of the new MEMS motors technologies that we've designed have truly, and the ASICs uh, in addition, um, have enabled us that. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a specific mic later, Cornell 2, that's a, a newer mic for us, just as an example of parameters. Uh, that that 1% distortion is 130 dB and that 10% is 132 dB. So we've really linearized the microphone over, you know, a higher uh, SPL range uh, to make it a, you know, a more useful microphone. Uh, and that applies to A and C directly. Um, we talked about LFRO. Um, that can be really important for um, algorithms, uh, minimizing phase change at the lower frequencies. A lot of the times when we look at an A and C curve, maximum benefit is around 200 hertz. Um, so we're really, that's where we want maximum gain. 
which also means I want the lowest noise because I'm putting a lot of gain in. You know, noise will rise with gain and it, it comes along for the ride. So we want to have particularly low noise at that point. So we want that high pass filter that the, the LFRO presents as low as possible um, to make sure that it's not noisy in that area and also to try and mitigate phase change um, so that our, we have less problems to try and uh, deal with when we're doing the ANC uh, algorithm. Um, the catch point of that is actually too much low frequencies can actually especially um, uh, interfere with the stability of the ANC algorithms, especially those that are adaptive. Uh, so when you tap or click, um, swipe, uh, a lot of those situations are very low frequency and 140 dB plus. Um, so when we talk about an AOP, our highest AOP microphone right now is about 135 dB. Mm hmm um, and we're hitting, you know, slightly higher than that. And, you know, think of snapping on your, your pair of pair yeah. headphones and you snap that on. Those are actually, you know, really high, close to DC pulses. Um, so those are also situations we're trying to deal with uh, and, and make sure that there's not necessarily that there's no distortion in those situations, but that there's no abnormality that happens, anomaly that either throws the ANC out of whack, it can't handle that pop or click or that super high frequency anomaly, you know, that happened along with that DC pulse, um, you know, just anything that it doesn't expect and therefore it can't correct for. Mm. Um, signal to noise ratio, uh, I think we, we talked about that a little bit and that was the balance of, you know, electrical noise, acoustic noise, MEMS motor noise, um, they all have all the, the, a little bit of a contribution. They all contribute a little bit in, in a different band. Um, even the high frequency resonance that has a, an inherent amount of noise uh, 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 attributed to it. Um, the digital to analog conversion internally, that has some noise. So those are all aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that led into size as well. So in-ear, true wireless, obviously smaller is better. We're, we're trying to stuff batteries, DSPs, uh, you know, sensors, blood oxygen, oxygenation. You know, they're trying to put so much technology in that small package and have it last forever. Um, so battery life and power, there's so many uh, impacts of, of what we're trying to help our customers enable uh, that we have to deal with. So size, smaller more noisy we got more random air molecules that have no place to go except hit the diaphragm so acoustic noise goes up i can take the same mems motor same asic put it in a larger package and most of the time noise goes down the the acoustic can contribution of that um to that whole noise equation so you know that's that's a direct impact um and then thermal too you know that asic creates heat um smaller area more heat is created in that smaller area thermal noise goes up too um, so these are all considerations that kind of play into the size of the microphone and, and how do we get the best performance um, what's um what size of diaphragm are we talking about i mean it's down at the level where you're saying random air molecules are influencing <laughs> noise flow yeah um you know so that's that's a great question it, it changes per design um you, you know i don't actually off the top of my head know some realistic um uh dimensions so there's two different design aspects so we're a little bit strange you we generally walk into the commercial aspect of mems microphones um and that's you know your iot devices and cell phones and in uh anc systems we also do the hearing health portion of it which is mm -hmm. you know very distinctly different because of lower voltage they work on 0.9 volts. They're running off a battery constantly. So we have what's a, a four MEMS motor technology in that. So it's one, we're increasing our signal to noise ratio by adding more motors. Um, so they tend to be a little smaller, um, but there's more of them. And then in the commercial microphones, we have two or one single large uh, diaphragm. So there can be some pretty 
uh, dramatic uh, differences in size of those. Um, but but in general, uh, you know, a quarter of a millimeter or less. Um, wow. So they're they're small. Yeah, they're they're not the major portion of the uh, MEMS motor. If you if you look at the input of the port in the PCB or either the top of the can, uh, we call that top port or bottom port. So bottom port would be the holes in the PCB side. Ninety percent of the microphones do that, um, or top port. Uh, means that there's a, a metal can that goes over the MEMS microphone. There's the acoustic port there. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's not much larger than an acoustic port. So that acoustic port opening is about 0 0.35, 0 0.45 millimeters. Then directly is access to the actual diaphragm. Uh, and that diaphragm is just a little bit larger than that opening. Um, so that may be 0.6, 0.7 maybe millimeters of open area uh, in that diaphragm. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're not huge, definitely. Wow. It's, it sounds to me just like listening to all this that the that one of the major barriers to entry to get into the game of producing these is just the, the manufacturing, the quality control and manufacturing. I mean, it's, it's got to be incredibly tight. And you, you mentioned a bit about that earlier. So it's uh, quite... quite yeah, it is. It is absolutely a challenge. I mean, in, in one of our test systems is 48. It's, it's obviously it's all automated uh, robot, um, 48 test systems in one machine, and there's a room full of machines. Um, so you're, you have room noise and all those other kind of things that are infecting <laughs> this as well too, you know, really fast cycle times, room noise, uh, acoustic settling time for low frequencies. There, there's a lot of uh, difficulties. Uh, and that's probably one of the things I truly enjoyed the most learning here. Uh, I was not very good at test and measurement. Uh, prior to Knowles, I was just a loudspeaker guy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this is really, I learned so much about test and measurement and stuff because they're so difficult. Cool. Um, so latency, also one of those things we have to worry about. Um, and from a digital mic, that's also clock cycles. How fast am I? We're doing the digital conversion internally. One of the great things about that is we, we're capturing it before all the noise gets into the system. So, you know, we're doing the, the digital conversion Therefore, um, you, it takes a lot of signal to uh, noise signal to corrupt a digital signal. So that makes it a lot easier to send it on down to the codec. We're, we're, we're sending out PDM. Uh, PDM gets sent into the codec, and the codec is uh, converting that with a, a decimation filter into, um, you know, digital, uh, fully uh, just straight bits. Um, so we take a lot of the noise impact out of that. Um, that also inherently, so you look at a digital microphone versus an analog microphone, you might say, well, wow, that power consumption is really huge. But you have to look at it from the whole system. We took a stage of digital conversion out of the power impact of your downstream. Um, so you really need to think of it that way. SNR, you may say SNR on a digital mic, uh, we're definitely, you know, we're at 69 dB right now in a digital mic in a major commercial MEMS microphone. Um, when you say, well, I could have a 71 or 72 dB analog mic in this situation, typically by the time you look at the complete system though, we usually win by a dB because you look, they still have to do the digital conversion. They have to send the analog signal down line into an A to D. That A to D has to do, has its noise in the system. Um, and then there's power supply rejection that's typically not very good in an analog mic compared to a digital mic. So all those effects, uh, not that you can't have a great analog mic in a great system, but you have to have an A to D with a huge amount of dynamic range. We, you know, these mics are coming out at 102, 104, 105 dB dynamic range. So think of what you need for an A to D to capture that kind of dynamic range. Mm -hmm. That's a really costly A to D which is not typical in most of our, here's an ANC system that I got off the shelf. Uh, those are not common. Um, so digital mic really makes that solution a lot, lot easier for customers as well. 
Um, but we have... Hey, just before you uh, move on, you've just mentioned their analog mic ASIC delay. What's the ASIC delay of an analog mic? No, they're, we're still an analog. Uh, so let's think in an MMS microphone, there's still an ASIC. It's still got a time delay. It's got a, a little bit of... Uh, um, taking that MEMS motor input, adjusting some gain. It, it's pretty minimal in, in uh, respects, but you still have some sort of gain that's that's usually part of that. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, and then, so what's commonly happens in a digital mic uh, depends on clock cycle, right? So there's a clock cycle you can put into our uh, digital mic, and the higher the clock rate, obviously the the faster, um, uh, the shorter clock period, which also means that we are passing the digital signal on down the line quicker uh, at a lower latency as well. So about 11 microseconds, uh, I think is typical for one of our systems. It takes about 32 clock cycles um, to get um, a digital mic PDM um, uh, data into codec. Um, and so you just think, okay, what's the clock rate, faster clock rate, the faster it gets, uh, the whole, uh, signal gets into the PDM codec. Um, therefore latency is, is lower. Um, then there's also the barometric relief, which is a filter, which also changes latency from group delay perspective. So we have analog and we have digital effects that are combining together. Um, and so, those are all part of this, the, the conversation when we start talking about latency. Um, but in general, most of our customers, they are pushing us for lower latency. We are looking to get five sub five microseconds in latency delay um, because we have to look at the latency in the whole system again, right? This is a system problem. I send my signals a codec, it takes it to the DSP, we cancel our noise, we send the signal back out so we can cancel it. That takes time. Uh, we want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, and so uh, we're striving to get better. We've really gotten to the point where we're almost on the point where customers are saying, yeah, you're getting us small chunks of, of uh, cancellation improvement. We're really kind of reaching the limits of what we can do uh, with, you know, improved cancellation, you know, lower latency microphones, because uh, it's, the whole system, a lot of people are getting 30 to 50 microseconds throughout the whole system. It's a latency. The difference between 30 and 50, a dB, half a dB, you know, that's kind of the, the area we're looking at for latency. Maybe some high frequency extension that maybe, you know, maybe the, the, the best potential we can, we could add to that of saying, um, now maybe one, two, three kilohertz, maybe I can start to get, a feed back or feed forward system to give me some benefit there. So um, I did mention LFRO again, but I think, and I mentioned maximum gain. I think one thing I didn't mention about feed forward mics tend to be on the outside. Um, and so that is where um, wind noise has a huge impact. So some customers may want to say, I'm going to want a little bit higher roll off on my feed forward mic. Maybe that's 100 hertz or 90, 80, 90 hertz instead of 25 hertz for the feedback microphone um, to maybe mitigate some of that low frequency noise. And that most of the feed forward benefits are at higher frequencies. So we're not adding noise to where we're going to have maximum gain. Um, and so that is uh, less of a problem. Um, getting a little dark in here. Maybe a turn. Is that a little better? Nope. Light went out. Oh, my bulb went out. Okay. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with it. Okay. Uh, feedback. Okay. Feedback is the same thing uh, as that minimum phase impact. We want to lower LFRO because maximum gain is around 200 hertz. Uh, and so that's where we want some minimal noise impact. Um, so we kind of talked about a lot of these things. And so the pictures will help enable a little bit about what I was talking about. Um, the typical MEMS microphone on the left, uh, just very simplistic. Um, you see the mic input right there is typically the MEMS motor. Um, 
we tend to put the back plate there. One that, uh, uh, or the back plates on the other side, uh, typically, that prevents ingress from getting in between the diaphragm and the back plate. So that helps ingress. Uh, we were talking about dust impact and, you know, yeah. water impacts. We'll also get to that. So if we prevent particles from getting in between the back plate and the diaphragm, we help reduce those kind of uh, failures. And, um, and so is, is bottom, this is a bottom mount kind of picture here. Is, is that kind of the de facto implementation now? Because they used to be ported on the top a little bit, but is this the direction yeah. now? And so if you think about, and I, I talked a little bit about this uh, with um, um, acoustic noise situation. So let's take uh, the aspect here. Can you see, actually see my mouse when I move it over yeah, here? Yes. By the yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. So if I look at this and um, uh, here's my uh, diaphragm, and then I actually have the whole back case as my back volume, right? Um, so the random molecules that I said are acoustic noise and randomly bumping into our diaphragm causing some acoustic noise. Um, they have some space to spread out. There's fewer molecules bouncing against the diaphragm at any one point in time. Um, in a typical top port design, let's look at it from this aspect where we would seal this off mm -hmm. and now we would put in a can or an opening in the top can. So now we have a really small back volume on that microphone. And those molecules are a bigger percentage of the acoustic noise because this volume of air um, is constantly hitting that, that diaphragm and, and causing noise. Uh, so that's one of the bigger impacts there. Um, it also raises the resonance really high. Um, uh, and so there's uh, some other impacts there. We tend to stick to this kind of design because of that impact. We, we get better SNR um, because of it. Um, and so we have built some designs where we actually re reverse everything. The motor's on the lid and we made it a top port. And then all the solder pads are totally isolated from the acoustic port. Um, but it's not, not the uh, premium uh, uh platform that we like to build on so we typically build with a bottom port mic okay we achieve the highest snrs that way um so and then just depicting over here is kind of okay you know if this is my input uh from the outside world uh basically it's a solid diaphragm um there's very few there's a small there's a barometric relief sometimes that leak is even just the leak around the diaphragm um, so it's, it takes a little more work for that particle to get into this gap. Um, and, and there's enough voltage here, electrostatic force, that that uh, uh, particle, dust particle, can actually short and cause, um, it, it can cause failure. Um, so we try to avoid that altogether. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, we, we kind of talked about, you know, the common ANC systems. We have the feed forward. Um, so I'm measuring all the, the noise of the outside world that's coming in. I have time to react, um, send a signal and cancel. So uh, latency is not quite as critical as here. Um, we talked about low frequencies is not a crit is quite as critical. Um, and so those, those situations are mitigated. However, in the feedback, we're actually, you know, we're hearing it. Um, we have all these types of situations of where we have pass through through the plastic. So all the noise that actually gets transmitted through the headphone. We have sound that gets around the headphone. We have sound that's transmitted through the bones in our, in our, our cheek and our head and get into the ear canal. Um, and, then, and then we have occlusion from low frequencies being sealed so there's all these types of situations that we're dealing with um, that have a different acoustic path uh, than what is being canceled by, by the outside world. And uh, so that's what really makes feedback pretty difficult. There, there's a lot of things that are changing. Um, the seal changes from user to user. So that's where adaptive ANCs, though they are much more difficult and stability is, is more critical about 
maintaining uh, stability, um, they they can adapt to a lot of those differences, and that's what makes them superior. Mm. Um, I wanted to also talk about a little bit, so this is maybe a layup of some of the mechanical impacts that start to happen when we actually util utilize a microphone in the real world. Um, so inside the ear, pointing towards the ear canal, we might have a, a feedback mic. On the outside, we may have a feed forward. We have gasketing, and then also there's mechanical path lengths um, that that shell is, and these all affect our frequency response, um, as well as even just pressure inside the ear. So if we have a dynamic in here, that's actually pressurizing the internal. Um, and so that actually impacts the microphone. So that actually pressure can move the top can of the microphone and and produce a pressure that is a noise signal. That's what we're not trying to cancel. Um, and so there's a lot of impact of vibration impact from a moving mass, whether it's a, a balanced armature speaker in this case, or a dynamic, um, that vibration impact can get into our microphones, that acoustic pressure can get into our microphones. And if there's a leak, we have a direct acoustic path around our gasket into the microphone. Whoops, I did not want to do that. Um, so those are all design considerations that are are affecting our microphone performance too. And that's really what makes ANC and, and especially in true wireless situations really difficult. There's there's more problems than just ANC going on. Um, and, and those are uh, very difficult to solve. Right. It's almost like it's it's tiny. So like there's what we use the word micro coupling between the speaker and the and the pickup. So it Right. Orders make it difficult. And typically isolation such as, okay, rubber boots or silicon gaskets and stuff like that are really don't work and sometimes make things worse. Um, these, you know, you put the assembly together 10 times and you may get 10 different uh, 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 frequency responses uh, because of those vibration feedbacks and how much pressure is put on that gasket once versus time two, three, four. So that's really what makes uh, manufacturing also difficult in these situations. Right. Oops. So we've probably seen some of these type of graphs before. Um, so the key is we have an active part of our noise canceling. So we have the feedback plus the feed forward. Typically that's called the hybrid system. We have also the passive isolation. So this is where really an in-ear device can really uh, – uh, work really well because it it really is isolating a lot of the high frequencies um, in, in this example. Um, so your total ANC is the active part of the system plus the passive. And so um, that's where you really get some good benefits. Down here is typically where we get really good noise cancellation um, and uh, here the low frequencies uh, there's usually we we don't do as well in, in those situations. Okay. Um, so this is kind of what I was talking about mechanical influence. So, and here's a resonance. So this is 10, 20, 30. So we're about 38 kilohertz. So this green response here is the mechanical resonance of um, uh, Cornell 2. It's just a, an example of one of our most popular microphones. And then what I did was I put on some fictitious acoustic load. So uh, I have a, even the acoustic mesh in here. Um, I have a, this is a pretty ridiculous length of tubing. Uh, probably not, not practical, um, but it does show what happens is this main resonance right here moves down right into a frequency band. So this is now seven, eight, yeah, seven kilohertz. So if do you I, think that, that, that is, is that implying that you've changed the effective mass of the diaphragm or is that a different uh, resonance that's being generated? So when you have a tubing resonance, so that length of yeah. cavities uh, in front of the microphone, you've now created one, there's a Hemholtz resonator, right? You have the neck of a bottle, which is the acoustic path, and then you have the volume of air inside the cavity of the microphone. So you have a Hemholtz resonator there. Then you have the length of tubing. 
um, that, you know, they have their own inherent resonances that they will support. Um, and so this is the main mechanical resonance. So that's the effects of that mass. So that column of air that's inside that acoustic path is now that's a moving mass. We've added that mass to the mechanical system. So we shifted our main mechanical resonance all the way down to seven kilohertz. Now these peaks are probably quite often, these are the tubing lengths inherently and maybe some Hemholtz resonators of the cavity. So they all start to, you get multiple peaks. Uh, so it really gets, can get, get pretty nasty. Um, now we can, like I mentioned, that these are pretty high Q type of diaphragms are really stiff. So that mechanical resonance Q is, is very high. It's not well damped. And so if an algorithm so guy saw this and he's trying to do a voice recognition or maybe he's trying to do beam forming, um, he would probably freak out right about now. <laughs> so he's got all of this additional gain. His algorithm is not tuned for this is not designed for this and the small variations that we encounter in manufacturing from adding a damper or waterproof membranes well waterproof membrane would vary adds a lot of inconsistency because those are tension diaphragms and so tension when those are applied can just this peak could shift all over he wants a stable frequency response and when things change if this gain slides down just one more kilohertz he's got another probably five dB gain in, in his bandwidth in an area he never expected. So it's pretty dramatic, those gain changes. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's just not uh, a good way to try and design stuff. So what we do is try and mitigate. So if we start out with a really high resonance and then we put on maybe a little more reasonable um, uh, acoustic path length here, maybe the resonance comes down to 10 kilohertz, maybe 15 kilohertz. And then we can put a screen or a mesh, uh, just a resistive mesh in front of that port. Um, and then we could dampen that peak out. So we can really round off this peak and help mitigate it. In this position, I would put a bunch of a really high damper here. Then I also start affecting S and R too. So there's, there's negative impacts of just saying, well, I'll just throw a higher rail damping screen on here and fix this problem um that it doesn't it, it actually will deteriorate microphone performance um so it's a you got to really balance uh, all these uh problems okay um and then also that impacts phase and as you can see and one of the other things here too so this low frequency roll off as you can see this is a pretty uh low roll off the minus three db is down here around 20 hertz um, so that is the barometric relief, and that is the fil filtering that we've talked about. If we look about where maximum noise cancellation is in, in a typical system, this 100, 200, um, we've, of course, there's a still a phase impact, but we're really mitigating it versus something that had a minus three at 100 hertz. Um, and so we're, we're trying to mitigate that for the, the overall PNC stability. Right. Um, just another way of looking at this is, you know, this is typically what happens as you saw the maximum noise canceling was right here. Um, and this is because this is where we're most stable in our open loop gain in an ANC system. So this is where maximum gain is. That's where we want the least amount of microphone noise to contribute to our system. And as we get into lower frequencies, you can see the reason we become unstable is, unstable is because of phase. Um, and so if you start adding more gain at 180 degrees out of phase, you start to, you get a, a, a um, too much gain and you get squealing noise. Um, so that's what we're trying to avoid. So you know that gain is zero at 180 degrees phase. So that limits the system. Uh, so a lot of tricks are played about venting in, the, in an in-ear device and how to mitigate some of this to maximize gain and get lower noise uh, frequency response. Um, but LFRO is a part of that, right? We're, we're one single part of that equation of the dynamic has latency. The BA has latency. They have, they all have a contribution to uh, group delay and how they're affecting the overall stability of the phase in the whole system. Okay. Um, 
Uh, this is more of a, a dynamic uh, and BA uh, impact, but just kind of showing what we're typically doing in a situation is they may have various frequency responses, but they're both minimum phase system. If, if you take a minimum phase system, you can equalize them uh, and equalize them to mitigate this, this uh, um, frequency response flat. Um, so, and that's what we want in that ANC system is, is ways to e equalize this because if the frequency response is flat, that means phase is minimum. And now we have a stable ANC feedback loop over a wider bandwidth. And a microphone is part of this equation. So I'm just trying to bring together all the parts that really make the system stable. Um, and I think finally, I just kind of wanted to go over just you know, this is some of the parameters that you might see in a data sheet uh, and, and kind of, you know, just walk through those a little bit. Yeah. Um, and the, the best way to, you know, compare yourself is instead of a competitor and uh, just uh, compare where we were in a, a previous microphone. Cornell is, a, is one of our most popular microphones. Millions and millions and millions of these have been sold. So we created, came out with the big brother, uh, Cornell 2, which is a derivative of that with some improved robustness. Um, you can see some changes of, we changed the resonance a little higher. That was to mitigate some of that gain in the voice bandwidth after mechanical impacts. Um, we lowered LFRO a little bit in this situation for an ANC situation. Uh, this is one of the biggest keys here. We talked about 1% THD and where it impacted. In our older design, um, it had 130 dB, 132 dB AOP. So the 10% was the same, but the 1% is now much better than this improved. And that was that was a, a motor type design uh, improvement in our in our design. So um, again, a, a few more things. We talked about clock right. Um, obviously, for latency, if I was uh, interested in the design and, and, and wanted the lowest latency, I would go up to, um, you know, 4.8 megahertz or 3.072 megahertz. Um, so the negative impacts of that would be, um, and our old design was that SNR was impacted. Uh, so it was a function of, of ASICs there. Um, and now uh, we've maintained that, so it's always constant. Um, that the SNR is is improved there. Um, power consumption. This, I, I'm just saying this. This is a this is a digital microphone, the Cornell two, and it's what is it? O six four four is the part number. Yeah, so that that is the part number right there, and then the Cornell. There's another one. I think it might be O six seven four. It's an analog differential output. Yeah, does that so sound familiar? That's the Winfrey. Um, uh, that is our analog mic, and that's a 70 D, dB SNR mic. That's an SPM 0687 um, H, uh, yeah, L5H. Yeah. How does that compare with this uh, Cornell 2 microphone and those performance specs? So, yeah, so SNR, you would look at um, 70 dB SNR. Um, the... Uh, Power consumption would be lower. That's probably around 650, 750 um, microamps. Mm -hmm. um, and the AOP is 130 dB. Um, so still very high. Yeah. 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 Um, and that has single-ended or differential. So that, that's a good option for that case. So if you are doing an uh, uh, analog ANC system, that is a great choice. Yes. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. And yep. Um, one, one thing that uh, we didn't really mention so far that I find just astonishing with the MEMS microphones is the consistency over a batch, the tolerance of, of uh, sensitivity. It's just a different world compared to the uh, electric microphones altogether where the whole ANC trimming was a big, big deal. And now it's just it's not that much of a big deal. Yeah, literally. So basically all of our variants comes from lot to lot variants. So if you think about maybe a single lot, it's all coming from the same silicon. 
So you think about all the things that may affect the performance of that uh, microphone. The tension's the same, came from the same silicon, same batch. It's doped the same. I mean, there's it's just really consistent. Um, and so then when you take and put that into the completed microphone, really the only impacts are ASIC um, and trimming. So we actually trim every microphone. So we're testing, measuring, seeing the sensitivity, trimming it, burning that in uh, on our ASIC uh, and sending it on down the line. So everything is plus or minus one uh, dB. Um, and if you look at that from a, a you know family, that that typically normal distribution, if you looked at it from a st statistics perspective, is a very normal, tight tolerance. Um, so if it's, you know, if it's minus 21 dB uh, full scale sensitivity, um, you know, there's a really tight distribution around minus 21. Now, if you go to the next lot, that might be minus 21 and a half. And the lot above that might be, tw you know, 21 or, um, you know, 20 and a half. So overall, the distribution still stays within that, you know, that one dB. But it's if, if you got one reel and you built all of your parts with that one reel, the chances are those are all really tightly, pretty closely matched. Uh, they're they're gonna be very stable. What's really more important is that stability over life. Uh, temperature and humidity really doesn't change hardly at all. It, it's pretty amazing from that perspective. Yeah. Right. Um, so it must, must be a lot of effort into the material science behind it so you don't get any kind of degradation over time. Yeah, and that's one of the probably the, the stranger things that in this market is there are some competitors out there, but we, we design our own ASICs, uh, so we have control over that. Um, and we have... Um, uh, a lot of our, uh, we design our own MEMS motors. Um, obviously, we do have someone make those, um, but they're designed to our specifications and our design. Um, and so that really kind of makes us unique from having control over that whole aspect and process of the MEMS microphone. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is just second page. Uh, we do have what's called a low power mode, which is kind of great, especially for an A and C. This is a, probably a, a possibility. Um, so you can go down to 260 microamps. AOP, AOP would fall a little bit in that situation. So if you look at the 10% AOP, it drops to um, 116 and then 113. Um, but there are situations where somebody's like, I want to go, and you can dynamically move from a a full bandwidth uh, um, type of mode into a low power mode anytime you want. Um, so if there's an application where you're not doing A and C, you could shut the mo uh, the microphone off. Um, you could run in low power mode. Um, and so you could, there's quite a few things that you could do uh, to mitigate power. Uh, and, you know, a true wireless design, this becomes important too. Um, you're always consuming power somewhere, so let's mitigate as much as possible. Uh, and that's a clock rate change. So your master chipset would just change the clock rate on the on the microphone, help conserve some of that power. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and I believe that was kind of it. All that I had prepared. So. Okay. Fantastic. All right, let's uh, go back to showing our ugly mugs and, and big here. Um, okay, well, I guess uh, that's a lot of detail on, on MEMS microphone for ANC application. So I think I'll throw it over to Simon. You got any more questions? The, uh, we're going past an hour on MEMS, so let's... Uh... <laughs> I think we've got enough, uh, enough to work with for a little while. That's fantastic, Eric. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, Eric. Thank, thank you so much. It's outstanding um, information. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I will as soon as we click off. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's let me tie this off for the viewers. Okay. Thank, thanks everybody for watching today, and um, let's uh, please click like and subscribe if you want to know more. We're doing this every week. So thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.